I let Ed have the day off since it's Father's Day. It was my, it was my Father's Day present to him. It was quite cheap. <laughs> In the books. So as we go through the week this week, um, Miss Sandy is going to start her uh, women's Bible study back up on Tuesdays at 930. We're so excited for that, Miss Sandy. She's going to start in First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 17. Um, if you haven't been a part of one of Sandy's studies before, you really should. She is such a blessing as a teacher, and there's always great conversation, and um, it's just a blessing. And I'm so glad that you are feeling up to starting that again. Um, Wednesdays, we have music practice down here at 7 in the evening. Sarah's got her summer alarm set, keeping us all on track. Two weeks in, and we've not been late yet. Next week is VBS. Um, I think I've made, well, I didn't make, I made Gavin fill out a lot of uh, forms for everybody, so. Um, <laughs> So there, but there are sign-up sheets in the back uh, for VBS. Um, just keep praying for the kids that are going to be coming and for their hearts as they learn more about God and Jesus and his love for them and for the teachers as they prepare for the week. Yeah. <laughs> Pray for me as I go through this week. <laughs> um, it looks like um, we're, as far as prayer requests go, we are continuing to pray for Stan. It sounds like he's in his, the rehab center and doing well so far. Good. Um, we're praying for George's niece, Maureen, Riley, Tiffany, and the boys. Um, continuing to play, pray for Lucas by Candy, um, Jeremiah and his parents. Uh, praying for Miss Ellen and her house and for Miss Sandy as she continues in her recovery, and we're just so thankful for how that's going. Um, do we have any other prayer requests this week? I do. I have grandbaby number three being delivered tomorrow, so please keep Alyssa in your prayers as she gets ready to have baby Grayson. Anybody else? I have a praise. Yes, you do. <laughs> I'm grandpa again. Number 13, you said? Number 13. Woohoo! Woot! <laughs> Do we have any other praises while we're on to that? You know, I am so thankful for everybody who's volunteering for VBS and um, all the hearts and minds that gets changed during that week. Um, as you can see, we've got our, our missions for VBS already started. Um, our missions this year goes to uh, providing language appropriate Bibles for other countries and let's see here how many Bibles do we have so far 19 19 woohoo you guys rock and is that's the real important thing but it looks like oh the curls snuck ahead <laughs> 120 to 114 so it's close so by the end of the week for VBS, either Pastor or Miss Joe will have a galactic pot of faith. So, if you love Miss Joe, put money in the girl's bucket. All right. <laughs> but again, the real goal is to provide Bibles for um, the other countries, for every $12 that we raise, we send a Bible across seas. Um, let's see here. I think that's about it as far as announcements goes. Um, can I have all my kiddos come up here and take a seat for me for a second? Yeah, you kiddos too. Yeah. It's Father's Day, so we got to celebrate our dads. So if you guys each want to grab just one of those and hand them out to all the men. You can take one home to daddy, but go grab one and just... But guys, we love you so much. We are so thankful for the blessings that you are in our households. 
And to be honest, I have to... Father's Day is very special to me. My real dad, not a great guy, and God knew that going in. So he made sure that I had fantastic men in my life to help me along the way. In the church, especially, I have my other another father, we all call him pastor. I have Henry, who he doesn't get a choice, but he has to be. <laughs> Poor Doyle's had to watch me grow up for years and years and years, poor guy. But I am so thankful for all the father figures in our lives. I'm so thankful for my father-in-law and what he puts up with. <laughs> but you guys have no idea the blessings that you are being here in the church, being godly men who help raise our children. You are amazing and we thank you so much for the job that you do. I'm going to go ahead and pray before I start crying. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for, for being our Father and for giving us all that you, all that you do, Lord. We, you gave us our, your Son so that we could be with you forever, and we are so thankful for that. We're thankful for the men that you give us to help us along the way, for all the dads in our lives, for the father figures, and just for their presence, Lord. We pray that you will bless them in a mighty way, Lord, and just put a hedge of protection over them and their households as they continue to guide and lead. Lord, we love you and we praise you for all that you do for us, and we just pray that you will be over pastors. He brings the message this morning, and we just continue to um, ask that we can be in your grace through this day and through the rest of this week. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Dad's, Happy Dad's Day. You know, I don't know, after I got, became a Christian and, and uh, started reading the book a little bit, I come upon this passage, I should have looked it up, but I didn't today. But trust me, it's there. And it says that we should not call anybody on earth our father. Okay, we only have one father, and that's God in heaven. Just like we ought to not be calling me a teacher, because we only have one teacher. And he's in heaven. And so I'm a facilitator, and I'm a dad. I'm a daddy -o. That's what I've, forever since I got saved, that's how I'd, uh, I'd make my cards to my dad. Or, or now I have a couple, my dad's passed, and since that's happened, there's a couple other men in my life who, who I've adopted. I sent one a card who's really rich. I gave him a card. He called me yesterday, like at 6.30 in the morning. He says, hey, thanks for the kind words, but know this, I'm still not putting you in my will. I said, well, then give me back the card. <laughs> dad's day. It's dad's day. Ooh. These year are, uh, these kind of, these kind of holidays are, have always been a little hard for me. I don't know why. You know, I don't know why. But today's dad, dad's today is our day. This is our day. I know that we would like all the other days of the year to be our day, but today is our day. Um, Father Day has somehow never been held in as high regard as Mother's Day. True story. Um, Mother's Day, years past anyways, it seemed like the pastors will always be saying, hey, Mother's Day is the best day of attendance in church. Historically, it's true. Um, you know, Dad's Day, I want to go fishing. I mean, I'm not going to drag my family to church. What are you, nuts? Let's go fishing. I got to tell you a little story about a Father's Day. Christopher was just a little tiny feller. And uh, I don't know how she did it. My wife was always doing little things like this, but we wanted a little rubber raft. I had two older boys, 
and we wanted a raft so we could go to Adam's Pond. I don't know if anybody knows where Adam's Pond is. It's just like a slough, really, is what it is. But uh, we wanted to go to, and so I got one. And so I decided, hey, I'm not going to church today, are you nuts? Me and the boys are going fishing. And so I'm telling you, we blew up this deal. I didn't have a truck. All I had was a car. So I tied this blowed up six-man rubber raft to the, you know, top of the car. With ro- I didn't even have any ratchet straps. It was just all string and ropes, and off we went. And we get in there, and we got in the water, because once you got to Adam's Pond, you have to walk, man, about three, four miles in there. It's a bird refuge, and and you, you can't, uh, but anyway, you had to walk, so we had to carry this. And I mentioned I had my young, my sons with me, and they were pretty strong. They were after that day, anyway. They got stronger. But we get the boat in the water, and we fish. I don't think we caught anything. But I'm going to tell you what, my wife gave me a bunch of grief about not going to church. And I know that that me, Justin, and David both came home that night with like fourth degree sunburns, man. I mean, I had blisters all over my body. You know what, I had hair then. And I had... I had hair then, but my head, the top of my head got sunburned. About two weeks later, it looked like I had dandruff as it was all all flaking off. It was horrible. You know, I've never went fishing on Dad's Day again, ever. Ever. I figured, okay, not only does it stop the wife from dripping, but uh, maybe the Lord's trying to, trying to tell me something. Um, you know, my point about Mom's Day is if you have a uh, hi, Mom. Have you ever heard anybody on the, you know, at the football game say, oh, hi, Dad? Ah, it just doesn't seem to be there. They're all, and listen, rightfully so. But nonetheless, I'm not complaining. I'm just pointing out a fact that uh, moms seem to be a little bit more appreciated than dads. You know, our scripture today, we're going to be in Luke But it's it's usually titled, if you have a study Bible or whatever, they're usually titled the prodigal son or the son returns home. Um, This story Jesus tells us, it's not very long, but it focuses on several family dynamics of which we can identify. I'm almost sure everybody in here can identify one, 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 one way or another. It deals with rebellion, sibling rivalry. Um, alienation from family, the consequences of foolish living, the joy of reunion, and the power of forgiveness. Um, that's the, 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 basically the outline of the prodigal son. And each one of these topics provides us with an ample thought and discussion material. But this morning... Instead of considering this, the parable of the lost, um, or of the prodigal son, I'd like us to think of it as the parable of a loving father. Of a loving father. Before we look at the scriptures this morning, I would like to share with you uh, a description of God creating fathers by a woman named Irma Boomdeck. And I had never heard of her until I was researching this, this deal. But from, she started at about 1965 all the way up to 1995. She was, she's wrote several Christian books. She had a columnist. Now, I don't know. That's all I know about her. But anyways, I liked what she said about here. So I'm going to read this, this little deal to you. It says, when the good Lord was creating fathers, he started with the tall frame. Huh. A female angel nearby said, What kind of father is that? If you're going to make children so close to the ground, why have you put fathers up so high? Um, He won't be able to shoot marbles without kneeling, tuck a child in bed without bending, or even kiss a child without a lot of stooping. And God smiled and said, Yes, but if I make him child size." Who would children have to look up to? And when God made the father's hands, they were large and and, and snidely. I don't know what that word meant. But the angel shook her head sadly and said, Do you know what you're doing? Large hands are clumsy. 
They can't manage diaper pins, small buttons, rubber bands on ponytails, or even remove splinters caused by baseball bats. And God smiled and said, I know, but they're large enough to hold everything in a small boy's, um, as a small boy empties his pockets at the end of the day, yet small enough to cup a child's face. And, the, and then the Lord modeled long, slim legs and broad shoulders. The angel nearly had a heart attack. Boy, this is the end of the week, all right. Do you realize you just made a father without a lap? How is he going to pull the child close to him without the kid falling between his legs? And God smiled and said, a mother needs a lap. A father needs strong shoulders to pull a sled balance a boy on a bicycle or hold a sleepy hand on the way home from the circus. God was in the process of creating two of the largest feet anyone had ever seen when the angel couldn't contain herself any longer. Um, that's not fair. Do you honestly think those large boats are going to dig out of bed early in the morning when the baby cries? Or walk through a birthday party without, without crushing at least three of the guests? God smiled and said, they'll work, you'll see. And they'll support a small child who wants to ride a horse to Banbury Cross or, or, or scare off mice at the summer cabin or display shoes that will be a challenge to fill. God worked throughout the night, giving the father few words, but a firm, authoritative voice, eyes that saw everything but, rem re but remained calm and tolerant. Finally, almost as an afterthought, he added tears. Then he turned to the angel and said, now are you satisfied that he can love as much as a mother? That's pretty cool, isn't it? You know, there is a clear difference between a dad and a mom. Um, clear difference. And I'm not even going to try to measure up to Simon. Simon really honored moms and what, you know, how, how they should be honored on Mom's Day. I thought he did a great job. Um, but we're different. Moms are the nurturers. Dads are the, I don't know. I've been watching a few movies here the last month or so where, you know, we got these, heard of Rambo. Well, there's a lot of Rambo women. I didn't know that until, you know, just recently. These one, one, one woman army go out and, def you know, I was telling Joelle last night, I said, yeah, it was kind of like that uh, brunette when we were kids on the commercials. They used to have this really good-looking brunette who come on, and she's, she's telling you, she says, I can bring home the bacon, I can fry it up in a pan, and, you know, and I can still show you that you're a man or some silly thing like that, you know? But listen, women aren't supposed to be always doing the things that a man does, and a man definitely is supposed to be doing the things that women do. We're created differently, different purposes, we're, but we're equal. I want to throw that in there. I think a lot of times throughout history, we've, 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 we've taken that out. You know, it's, you know, I'm guilty of it. I still blame Eve, you know. Anytime I step on a goat head, I'm blaming Eve. Trust me, you know. But uh, we're equal, but different, okay. We're equal. I think that we're equal when a man and a woman can come together. I mean, we, we balance each other out. You know, a child, a, a young man doesn't always need to be uh, coddled. Is that, I, I might be speaking at, at a school here, but they don't not always need to be coddled. And it's very hard for a mom not to coddle. I mean, I watched my wife with my grandchildren, and we're thinking that he needs to be swaddled. <laughs> and grandma's like, no. No, you know, that ain't just with the grandbabies. Mama Joe's always been that way, you know. No, I'm a protector of, of the weak, of the tiny. I'm the protector. Of, yeah, but they're devouring you, honey. No, no, it's all good. But see, dads, need, dads just got a different role, you know. I, I really, I know this is not very popular either, but you know what? I don't think that... Um, young men who were raised by moms only, 
get the, the whole the whole thing, man. A young man needs a dad. He needs to have a dad. And whether it's a biological dad, a daddy figure, whatever you want to call it, a young man needs a dad, needs a man. It takes a man to make a man. A woman cannot make a man. She can give birth to a man, but she can't make him. Now, I got to tell you, there's definitely some qualities that us men can't give our children. We can't give our men. That's where moms come in. You know, that's where moms come in. They're the nurturers. And I'm not saying dads can't be nurturers, but, uh, you know, I nurture in a funny way. Where's the Adams boys? They'll tell you. You know, <laughs> they came to work with me this week. And one day they were eager to come to work, and it showed. The next week they weren't, or the next day they weren't so eager, and it showed. <laughs> I had to tell my buddy Gavin, it was like, okay, man, this is the deal. Every time I give you a task and you have to go back and do it again, you have to pay me for whatever time that worked. That was that work. I'm just going to deduct it from your paycheck, buddy. How's that? You're not, you wouldn't do that. So, that's up for you to, 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 to decide. You know, he thought about it for a minute, you know, and it, it worked. I was able to motivate him that way. Riley, he ain't motivated quite like that. <laughs> he said, no, I don't want to really be here. And I said, okay. Anyway. Anyways. It's Dad's Day. Let's look at a dad who I think that we can, can find. Uh... And here's the real thing. At the end of the day, someone had mentioned early, earlier about Father's Day and, and God being our Father. And nothing else, I hope, if you're not there, if you aren't, aren't at that spot, that, that today, I think that this whole story is a story, a picture of our Heavenly Father waiting for His, his child, waiting for uh, His children to snap out of it, to get it. To come home, to truly come home, you know. Uh, let's let's just look at this story real fast, and you know, I'll. Uh, I'm, trust me, this is not going to be a super long message today. I know everybody's got things to do, but in Luke 15, in Luke 15, are you there? What's that? Huh? You guys, uh, you guys over here messing with my message, and I hadn't even really got started yet. In Luke 15, starts in verse 11, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. I don't know about you. I mean, doesn't that right away sound kind of goofy? Hey, Dad, uh, when you die, I'm going to get all this stuff, but I'd like it now. Now, I'm telling you what, when my dad was alive, I understood this kid's idea here. Okay, dad, why don't you give me my portion of the inheritance now? That way you can watch me enjoy it. He never did. He, he didn't want to watch me enjoy spending his hard-earned money, evidently. But anyhow, this dad did. Verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. See, and that's what my dad did not want to watch me do. Did not want to watch me squander it. You know, Joel and I have said this for a long time. You know, uh, wouldn't it be nice if the Lord could test me in being a, giving me a million bucks? Just test me. See how I do. I mean, it's a million bucks. What's that to the Lord? That's nothing. Test me. And if, I, and if I blow it, don't ever give me any more. But who knows? We might do well. Most likely not. Most likely at the heart of this old preacher here, I would have probably, it's mine, mine, all mine, then I would have run off to the foreign country. And uh, I just remember one time I... This, this woman comes into my office. I was a loan officer. I was writing loans for people, refinancing their homes. She comes in, and she says, we're in dire straits, and uh, we need help. We are um, buried in debt. You know, so visiting, they had a whole bunch of equity in their home. And so I said, well, 
This is what we've done before. Interest rates are down. Let's refinance your house. Let's pay off everything you got. And then you'll only have one payment. And we can, we can take the 30-year note. We put it into a 15-year note. Because they were paid off, it all worked, looked good on paper. Even the banks thought so because that's what we did. I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing up here today, two years later, the same little woman come into my office said, man, we are in dire straits. We're getting ready to lose everything. I go, well, how could that be? You guys were, were, you know, we were doing really good until we bought the Hummer. <laughs> we were doing really good until we bought the Hummer. I know, but I thought we had a plan. Well, like I said, we were doing really good until we bought the Hummer. What can we do? Did the same thing. She had a Hummer free and paid. You know, fast forward another year later, she comes in, same boat, credit cards. But now what they didn't have is they didn't have any equity. They had no way to get out. Not only did they have their house completely maxed out, and just a year or so later, they were underwater in that house. They owed more than that house would have praised for, right? They were... They had to do it the old-fashioned way. I mean, they never did come back around, so I don't know how it all worked out. But they squandered their stuff, man. They squandered it. And again, uh, I don't know where it all started, but, uh, but they definitely squandered it on foolish living. On foolish living. Um, and I'll admit, man, Give me a million bucks. First thing I'm going to do is buy a Harley Davidson, baby. That might be squandering my money on foolish living, but hey, that's what I would do. Huh? But I'd have a Harley. My wife won't let me drive it, but I'd have one. <laughs> Some. Somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna have to have a talk with that boy. <laughs> that dang, you know, my grandma used to always tell me. She says, "Where do you get that strut from?" And I had no idea what she's talking about. I, yeah, and it, I don't know where it comes from, but uh, it's definitely there. I don't think I got it, but must. verse 14, it says, "After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing." <clears throat> and then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. Have you ever been there yet? You guys ever been there? You know, you guys must be really, really well behaved people. Because uh, I remember, you remember, okay, it's all gone. Whether you work for it, whether you had it, it's all gone. And, and you get desperate. Have you ever been desperate? You know, I was so dang desperate in Casper, Wyoming, that I went to the, uh, to the food kitchen and listened to someone preach so I could have a dinner. I swore I'd never do that. I was, I was above that. Have you ever had to, have you ever had to, for whatever reason, go and sign up for welfare? I'm going to tell you, that killed me. My pride, it just crushed me. But what else was I going to do? You know, what else was I going to do? I know today, I know today what should have happened. I know what today does happen, because I wish I could say that I got saved and I stopped making stupid decisions. I got saved and had it all figured out, because that ain't true. I got saved and uh, still fighting that battle like we talked about last week, man. The, 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 the good angel and the bad angel. You know I mean, the, 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 the spirit and the nature of God versus our own sinful flesh. That's still alive and well. I made dumb decisions. Lots of them. Even since I've been saved. <clears throat> but
But what I learned, what I try to teach my kids, I try to tell anybody. Some people tell me, well, I can be a Christian and not belong to a church. Yes, you can. Now, you're not an obedient Christian, but you can be a Christian and not belong to a church. The whole idea of a church... And I have shared my testimony with you people a lot. You know, the year after we became a pastor, okay, not only did the Lord say, hey, you got to sell your portion of your loan office business, and you got to go work for Pat Dickert for seven bucks an hour, okay, because you got to be available for the church, okay? We think we're rolling right along. Then one night, I took a side gig. I'm working at Pat Dickert's in the morning, and two days a week I wash dishes at a restaurant. I mean, that's where I'm at. I'm 45 years old, 40 years old, whatever. Maybe not, maybe not that old, but old enough to know better. I shouldn't have to do that. But I say, hey, man, this is what the Lord wants me to do. I get a phone call. The wife is panicked. The daughter-in-law is panicked. The house is on fire. What do we do? Well, you get out. That's the first thing we do. Hang up the phone and leave. But uh, this was the first time the Lord showed me, Dallas, this is why you belong to a church. This is why you belong to a church family. Is uh, the wife and I never owned a microwave before that fire. A week after that fire, I had three of them. The week after that fire, I had furniture that my wife and I would have never been able to have. After that fire, we had a bed that didn't come out of the, out of the uh, dumpster or from the Salvation Army that had somebody else's pee stains all over it. Okay? I'm telling you, that's what the body, that's what belonging to a body of believers did for Joellen and I. And you know, we had insurance. I'm going to tell you a little more about this. this we had renter's insurance. We were just renting the house. We had renter's insurance. Um, about a month, two months before this, we had some, some tough times. And we had to either make this payment for the renter's insurance and car insurance or feed the kids. Well, my kids are going to eat. That's just how it is. So we got rid of the insurance. Then the house caught on fire. I'm talking to Lee Pounds. He's our insurance guy. After about 30 days after the fire, about $18,000 was brought in. This is $18,000 in cash plus all the prizes from the church. Not just the church we were attending, but people who were attending that church knew other people who went to other churches. Churches were sending Joel and I money who we didn't even know. But we belong to the family of God. I didn't have to go to welfare. Lee Pounce told me, he said, Dallas, you made up better than if you'd had this stupid little insurance policy I sold you. He said, he said uh, God, God stepped up to the plate, man. Okay, that's why we belong to the body. And not one person ever. That same year, some people that we just barely knew. I come home. I come home from Pat Dickert's place in my house. I am not joking. Our front room in this house up that they let us stay in was full of Christmas presents. I mean, it was insane. It was insane. But I didn't have to go and ask. I didn't have to go and ask the government. I didn't have to go and beg to Uncle Sam for anything. I didn't have to beg to my boss for something. I just didn't have to do it. Which, if it hadn't have been for the family of God, I would have had to do that. I would have either had to do that, or else I would have had to start stealing again. You know, because again, my family's going to eat. Okay, one way or the other, they're going to eat. And the Lord showed me, dude, this is how your family will eat. I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. You're my child. I love you. It's confusing. It's confusing from having a dad. I've shared this after my dad passed away. You know, uh, everybody in our immediate family, my sisters, and, and my mom for sure, and me. I mean, when dad passed away, we're like, my mom is the one who said, well, I don't know why you're putting all these chairs out at this mortuary place that they had the funeral. They said, nobody's going to come. I mean, your dad is mean. He's greedy. And everything my mom said was true. My dad was seemed to be selfish and greedy. 
You know, I have a, one of my younger sisters had a couple kids. She needed some money. My dad would not help her a bit. Wouldn't help her. She landed up, I don't know where she, what she landed up doing, but she landed getting it somewhere else. Dad said no. So we're just thinking, you know what? Our dad's just a, he's a winner. You know? And, uh, but at this funeral, there was about 110 people show up to this funeral. And right before the custom of doing at a funeral, say, oh, anybody got anything they want to say on behalf of Eric Claypool? And you know, out of those 110 people or so, I'll bet you half of them stood up and told us a story on how they were in need. And Blackie Claypool showed up with his wallet, showed up with a kind word, showed up with something. See, so my dad wasn't all these things we thought he was. He was just that way to us. He was just that way to us. My dad's reason is, is nobody ever gave me anything, so why should I give you anything? You'll be a better man for it. You'll be a better woman for it. <clears throat> hey, would you hand me that underneath there? I'm starting to yawn. Maybe I don't got enough caffeine today. Today I miss my dad. I don't know what I miss about him. I don't know if I miss him calling me meathead or whatever it was. But I do believe today any kind of work ethic I have, my dad, my, my dad instilled that in me. My dad instilled me not, you don't need a government. My dad instilled me if you work hard, you're smart with your money, then you'll be okay. And he's right. He's right. Most people who work hard and take care of their money are okay. Right? I just, I'm broke. I'm broken is what I'm trying to say. Something about me gets broken. I find myself in trouble all the time. I would work hard, but not very good with my money. But you know what? Like I said a minute ago, the Lord has always showed up. My children had zero idea how poor their mom and dad was. Okay? And how it all panned out, I don't know. Wrestling, football. Man, we moved to Idaho. We come from Gillette, Wyoming, where everything is free. In the public schools, we come to we come to Idaho, man. They make you pay for everything in the public school. Let's get it. What the, what's the purpose of public? I thought that was the whole point. It was paid for. Not not Gillette. I mean, that was a culture shock. You know what? If our kids wanted to play ball, they played. If they wanted to wrestle, they wrestled. If they wanted to do typing class, they typed. If they wanted to do woodworking class, it happened. And every bit of this stuff cost a bunch of money. Where did it come from? Certainly not my dad. Where'd it come from? Here, I'll be a little bit more. I'm going to just, just, just reveal a little bit more about myself. You know, before I got saved and before I married Joe Allen, we have six kids, seven kids. And I have seven children with four different moms. When I married Joe Allen, you know what? She, I married about a $30,000 credit card debt. Well, she married about 18 years of child support. And yes, I was behind. 60% of every nickel that I made at a legitimate job went to child support, almost Joel and I's entire marriage. Okay, so listen, if you work super duper hard and thinking that you're gonna get a thousand dollar check and you get a fifty dollar check after Uncle Sam and in uh, the past paid for it all, Ooh, a little disheartening. There were some days it was a little hard to get up and go to work. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. But I'm telling you all this to tell you how did I was, how was I able to still raise my children the way we did? How was David able to go to state? How was Chris able to, to, do, to do the things that, that they wanted to do? They did. How did Eli play baseball? You know how much money it costs to have your kid play league baseball? I mean, just to sign up is 500 bucks. That's not to mention, then there's always $100 here, $100 there, $100 here. But we never missed a lick. How? How? I'm telling you, because of our Lord and because of the body of Christ. That's when Jesus was really upset when, when uh, remember when he's in the house one place and he's, he's doing some healing and pretty soon his mom and brothers are beating on the door. 
and uh, they were afraid for his life. I think, you know, a good mom, yeah. But what did Jesus tell When they came to him and said, hey, hey, Jesus, your mother and your brother are outside. They want to talk to you. And he says, uh, my, mom, my mom and dad are in here. Okay? He, my mom and dad are in here. Whoever belongs to the family of God, that's who my brothers and sisters, my moms and my dads, that's who it is. That's what Jesus was saying. And I'm telling you, when I, since I've joined the body of Christ, God hasn't let me down. Now there's been, had my feelings hurt by people in the, in the body, of course. Get a feel goods hurt, that'll happen. But how silly of me, I, you know, I just come out of a however many year drunk. And for me to stand up here today and say that my feel goods didn't get hurt while I was out there, I'd be lying. My feel goods were going to get hurt no matter where I'm at. But here, like I said, we have wanted literally for nothing. Nothing. I didn't need to go and beg my employee for, for extra food for my kids. You know how that all worked? Is the neighbor next door who told me when we first came here, told me, he says, well, I'll never darken the, the property of that church, ever. You know what? That guy brings me meat on a pretty regular basis. Okay. Has. The wife, the wife and kids prayed over the fence line. Him and I were going to do fisticuffs over the fence line. The wife's praying. The next thing you know, we get meat. Her, her, her way worked way better than mine. Okay. People in the church, we've, it's just been, I don't even know, I'm just at a loss for what God has done in our lives. If he ain't going to do that in my life, he'll do it in anybody's life. I'm a nobody, man. I've never been a somebody. I've been five foot nothing forever, you know. I will admit, you know, here, now most of you knows that I, I smoke cigarettes, man. That's a real battle that I had after Eli passed away. But, man, I hadn't smoked for a long time before Eli passed away. And uh, I didn't have this either. This happened after I stopped smoking. My chest fell. My chest fell. So I don't know, man, if I'm going to stand up if you're smoking, be careful. If you quit, man, you might want to find something different because your chest will probably fall too. <clears throat> my point is I have, we haven't had to go and beg my boss for nothing. Definitely not pig slop. Verse 16, he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. Verse 17, when he came to his senses... He said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am, dying of hunger. How many of my father's workers have food, and yet I'm here dying of hunger? I love the part where it says he finally came to his senses. Isn't that what we have to do sometimes? Just come to your senses. An old guy, well, Troy. I used to work with Troy uh, um, Wench, or Ranch, or whatever his name was. We used to call him the trusty Wench. Or, anyway, I was working with him, and he would always say, Man, I thought you'd be better by now, but you're not. You're worse. He'd say, Snap out of it. Snap out of it. Come to your senses. Snap out of it. Snap out of it. Is there anybody here today who needs to snap out of it? Hmm? Do you need to snap out of it? Do we need to uh, maybe come back to our first love? Or maybe we need to come forward first and say, man, this is what they're talking about. I mean, I heard all these things that I'm explaining to you. I've heard people tell me. People used to tell me this stuff all the time, and that was good enough for you folk, but it ain't for me. 
until I come to my senses. I told you how I come to my senses. We moved to Idaho. <laughs> you know, we moved to Idaho. And uh, the wife and I, we moved to Idaho to save our marriage. Let's just tell you how it was. Because in Gillette, Wyoming, where we both grew up, that was not going to happen. Because I had my gang and she had hers and uh, they clashed. So we had to get away. I, would, I am thoroughly convinced that if I'd have stayed in Gillette, Wyoming, I would have died in a car accident. I would have drank myself to death. Something would have happened. We come to Idaho. The wife finds a church. Church. And then she gets to talking about marriage counseling because somebody at the church said, Why are you laughing? It ain't that funny. Somebody said, well, you guys need to go to marriage counseling. I got married. We got married by the justice of the peace. We got married from the same judge who just a couple of years before that said, Dallas, if you hit one more of my police officers, bring a toothbrush. You're going to need it. He performed the wedding. Marriage counseling. There was no counseling. Anyways, Leroy Lickness, who I was working for at the time, his wife thought that maybe it was a good idea, so she found me all these marriage counseling people. So you call a couple of them to be diligent. Do you know how much money they wanted? They wanted a lot of money to go to counseling. And at the time, the insurance we had ain't going to cover it. Or they had a Wednesday night Bible study at the First Baptist Church in New Plymouth. And she said that would be good. One or the other. Uh, you know, if we did have any money left, I definitely didn't want to give it to somebody whose marriage is probably horrible anyways. So I went to the Bible study. I went to the Bible study. And I thought for the longest time in that Bible study, if these Mr. Rogers, they don't know nothing. If they only knew who I am and where I've been and what I do, they wouldn't want anything to do with me. I honestly thought that. I honestly thought that. And then one night, at that Bible study, I came to my senses. Come to my senses. The Lord touched my heart. I'm not 100% sure that was the day I got saved, but I came to my senses. And I kept going. I kept going. And then pretty soon, the pastor, he wanted to take me out for dinner. Oh, great. Got to hang out with this guy. The first thing I told Pastor Phil is I said, I said, listen, I have smoked way too much pot. My head just does not work like everybody else's in this Bible study. And he just laughed. Yeah, okay. That's what he said. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> meet with him again. Meet with him again. You know, I tell you, when I got saved, after I come to my senses, it was about two years into this deal, right? I'm, uh, I'm preparing a message to preach. I got tricked, again, because I'm tightwad. First Baptist Church had a public speaking class. I'm a salesman. I mean, who is a salesman wouldn't want a public speaking class? But I bought, I paid for the books. I signed up. And they told me the first night, Dallas, what are you doing here? I said, Public speaking. And Charlie Bolt was teaching the deal, man. He said, dude, you know, you know this year is putting a message together, right? But what? <laughs> yeah, man, this year is for people who want to get up and preach. I said, well, you guys, you guys miss, the advertising was misleading. He said, man, don't feel bad if you don't want to stay. I'll get it. I think there was five of us in that class. Me and one other guy were the only ones who finished. Because you know why? I paid good money for those books, man. I am not going to just put them on the shelf and let it go to waste. That's not how we ride. I'm preparing part of that class as we prepare a message to teach on a Sunday night. When the good old faithful six people are there, you know, they didn't want to put you in front of the congregation straight away. And I take baths, whatever. You can think I'm strange or not. I don't care. I take a bath. And I had been working on this message for 
And this was a come to Jesus message. I'm going to show these people. I'm, have you ever sat in the bathtub, George, and you had, well, you guys, all you big people probably can't. <laughs> See, I'm, I got one on you. God knew exactly what he was doing by making me five foot nothing. As I'm sitting in the bathtub, I have my notes, and I'm looking at the water spout because it's all shiny, and I can see my reflection. And I'm preaching. I'm preaching up a storm in the bathtub to myself. You remember my old Bible? How about Braddy? And, well, it had fell in the tub. That was one of the first nights it fell in the tub. Because as I'm preaching telling people how they need to, to become a, a Christian, to let Jesus come in and save them. I broke down and started crying like a baby. I got broke. I got broke. I've told you guys before, I am so arrogant. I'm the only one. I, preach, I had to preach my own salvation message. <laughs> That's how arrogant I am, but I got saved. I got saved. And then, you know what? Even then, things didn't make sense. We shared this here a few weeks ago, maybe a little while ago. It really wasn't until we were baptized, Joel and I got baptized, that all of a sudden, all these pieces started to fit. They all started to make sense. And then it was almost like the way my life, I told you about Christmas time. And during the holidays, the dang church was always giving us food boxes of food and all this. But they wouldn't come and say, hey, they would put it on the doorstep, knock and run. I mean, we used to have, we used to do that too, but we called it something different than gifting food. You know, but we, but they would do this and I would take the food in the house. The wife, she quickly put it in the cabinet, but I'm like, okay. I go to Phil and say, hey, who's putting food in my doorstep and then leaving? He said, yes, we did. I said, well, don't do it no more. Man, I know. The next holiday comes around, the same dang thing. So I go, hey, man, I, this is, I pulled the dad on him. This is what my dad used to tell me all the time. Well, I thought we agreed. See, my dad, he, my dad would tell me something, like that's what we agreed to. No, that's what he said. It wasn't what we agreed to. I told Phil, I, think, I thought we agreed that you were going to do this no more. He said, never said that third time I go okay Phil I've had it you guys think we're indigent I'm kind of guys kind of need some help don't you I go yeah, not from you I said why do you guys do this he says Dallas he says why don't you just come in my office and say thank you okay I'm still going to Wednesday night's marriage couples therapy or whatever we called it. Been saved, been baptized. The next time it, it was a Christmas, the next time it happened, they, I had, they had to put up pillows and all these other little things in there. So we took it in again. The wife, she, she, she the wife, she, she's knowing what's going on. I'm always a little late. But I go to Phil and I uh, thank you. Turn around and leave. You know, we haven't got one dang box from them since. <laughs> Not one. Just thank you. But our point is it all started coming together. Okay? It all started coming together. And then after the fire, I mean, that was like, holy snap, this stuff is real. It works. And then after Eli's passing, I mean, those of you who were here during that whole thing, uh, you know, sometimes when this sort of stuff happens to people, their faith is uh, weakened. Their faith is, they question all these things. I'm going to tell you what, by the grace of God, I believe what happened with Eli's passing is Joel and I's faith was definitely cauterized, man. I mean, he, it just cinched it up so much. And again, I'm going to stand here and tell you, and you know, we didn't have a, a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out of when Eli passed away. We really didn't. Church was doing the best they could. Um, we didn't know what we were going to do. I'll tell you what I did is I called my mom the next day after Eli passed away and I said, I'm going to need some money. 
and I ain't asked my mom for money for years. Um, she said, yep, no problem. Whatever we need, we'll get. Way different than dad. You know, dad would have probably, yeah, tell him to go get a job. He'll be fine. Listen, we didn't get a bill for Eli's funeral. We didn't get a bill for nothing. And listen, it wasn't cheap. It wasn't cheap. Uh, money? This isn't any lie, Joel. And I looked that up the other day. Do you know that in a three-week period of time, not including the funeral being paid for, there was almost $30,000 in cash put in our hands? My mom came to that funeral and went home with every nickel she, she came here with expecting to spend. That's, that's God's family. That's, that's what God does. That's what he's done for us. You know, my mother-in-law, she asked me, father-in-law, I guess. Hey, are you going to, I suppose after this you guys are going to go home. And I'm Angel, and I scratched her head. Thought about it for about two minutes, and they said, you know, I'm starting to think maybe we are home. This has always been our home. Well, we just had to get here. This has always been our home. I don't know what other people are like in other places and other people's experience in churches. But man, but if it wasn't for the body of Christ, man, Joellen and I would be lost. If it wasn't for the body of Christ, I know one thing that's almost for certain is we wouldn't have been together. We're getting ready to celebrate 27 years, our 27th year. I tell everybody it's 127 because that first one was long. Okay, we would, if without the body of Christ, without the words of this book, without the spirit of God who keeps his promise, is, is the more I draw to him, the more he draws me to himself, the more he, he blesses me, he takes care of me. No, he doesn't always do it the way I want him to do it. But there's no denying that he does it. No denying that he does it. Took me a while to figure that out too. He does it. And he does it because I came to my senses. Just like this fella right here. Man, I'm out partying like a rock star one day, eating eating in the soup kitchen the next day, to having a, a robe put on me. And with a new ring, a, a new perspective on life, a new, new everything. See, some of the people who grew up in the church and leave and come back, that's familiar to us. It was all new. This was new. And every time I encounter God, it's new. It's refreshing. It's reassuring. He's like, this is what I'm talking about, D. This is what, we, what we've been talking about. Do you believe? Do you believe? How can we not? But I first had to come to my senses. I first had to get it. I first had to get it. <clears throat> Verse 18, I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still, here we go. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Listen to verse 22. But the father told his servants, Quick! Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast. Because, listen, what I want you to hear today. Because this son of mine was dead. 
and is alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. So they began to celebrate. You know how come my dad was so, I don't want to say stingy. Well, my dad was didn't really want to give his hard-earned money to his kids. It's because every one of us kids at one time or another have taken advantage of my dad's money. Okay? I mean, and again, it's taken me a lot of years to, to, to be able to, to confess that, to admit that to myself, so I can admit it to others. All right? These other people didn't take advantage of my dad. If you didn't take advantage of my dad, he'd give you his shirt off his back. But boy, if you do, he's done. You know, he's done. And I know a lot of people that way today who get done because someone done them wrong. Dads, if you're here today, whether you got old children, young children, the counsel's the same whether you're married or single. Whether you belong to a church, whether you have a job and you have to be around other people. Listen, this dad, he didn't ask his son to explain, well, what did you do with the money? He didn't ask his son nothing, did he? He seen the son who, who snapped out of it, come home and say, man, I've been, I've been, I shouldn't have done that, dad. He said, that's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Would I hear this dad say, and if you could read the whole story to maybe to get a little bit more of it, this dad says that uh, I can always make more money, son, but I can't always have my son. I get that so much today. Dads, you need to be working on forgiving people who do you wrong. If you have children, this is not a matter of if they're going to disappoint you. It's just going to be a matter of when. But how, how we respond as dads is going to affect them for the rest of their lives. It was very easy for me to be a guy that says, uh, I mean, you've heard me stand up here and tell you, no, man, if somebody does me wrong, I'll do it back and ask you how you like it. Can't be. No, somebody does us wrong. Somebody harms us, hurts us. Our children need to see us forgiving them, praying for them. You know, I was confronted again about this guy last week I was telling you about that the wife beat me up over. Have you thought about praying for him? Yes, and I didn't like it. Every time I have got on my hands and knees and prayed for somebody, then we become friends. And I don't want, I don't want friends right now. I just want to be bitter, I guess. But listen, dads, the characteristics of our Heavenly Father are definitely doable for us. We can do it. We can get there. But we have to learn how to forgive. We have to be, you know, I can't think of today one thing that any of my children could do to me that would make me say, nah, that's it. I'm done. You know, I'm done. Can't think of it. And uh, that was done to me. And uh, I know years later, many of you know the, the, that the last years of my dad's life, we were able to get together and we were able to talk. He interested in my faith, right? But, but he, you know, but he confessed a lot of things. We we talked. I, I felt really good when my dad passed away, you know, not, not for the reasons why some people might think, but, uh, but it was hard, and I never wanted my children to have that struggle, to have that fear, to have that worries that I had with my dad, and I definitely don't want my children passing that on to my grands, you know, I got, I got a football team of grandbabies. And uh, I want them to be all, have every chance to be the mighty men and women of God that they've been created to be. And that's not going to be if I'm over here beating my kids up with the book, telling, telling them one thing and doing another, right? Forgiveness, guys. One little thing. Simple. 
forgive. How simple is that, Henry? To forgive. Just forgive. You know, forgive. And know this, if you have children, which almost all of you here do, is, is that they will give you an opportunity to need to forgive them again. Just give them a little time. So we might as well get it all honed in now, right? And be like this dad who probably worked hard in raising his kids and building his fortune and all of this. I mean, we know how hard it is to get a little tiny nest egg and then to have your kid take it and squander it. Heartbreaking. But this dad knew what this dad here, like our Heavenly Father, knows what the, what's really valuable. What's really valuable. And to me, today, what's really valuable is all around me right now. My family, my church family. To me, that's, that's sooner a goal that I don't have, man. But I can love you and, and, and uh, walk through this all with you the same ways that you've all walked through this stuff with me. Well, I guess I told you what I told you. You'll have to read the rest of the chapter to find out the rest of the story. Not everybody, not everybody agreed with Dad's decision. And not everybody agrees with my decision. Not everybody agrees with your decision. But I didn't make Dad's decision wrong in his conviction. Um, because Dad knew it was right. It was the right thing to do. We have a God, thank goodness, who loves you. Um, like air talking to to some people the other yesterday i was talking with phil Pittman, and we're talking i don't know if we're talking or gossiping we might have been gossiping a little bit but the word un, un unconditional love i know that that's where my heart needs to lead and i need to go that way but you know what there's only one who has an unconditional love and that's God. I can tell my wife all day long I have an unconditional love for her, but trust me, she can do something that will make that unconditional love go away. We all are capable. Okay? Not, not God. He tells us that he'll never stop loving us, no matter what. The devil can't make him stop loving us. Right? Uncle Sam can't make him stop loving us. The neighbor can't make him stop loving us. My stupid actions don't make him stop loving us. My dumb decision, he doesn't stop loving me. He don't stop loving you. Nothing can take his love away from us. No matter how stupid we act, no matter how dumb of things we do, God loves us so much that sometimes he'll let us we'll go through the consequences of that dumbness. But uh, he always walks with you. And you know, he always hopes that you'll do better next time. That's, that's the God that's in the Bible. That's the God I serve. He's not the God who, because I blew it today, that I'm cut off. Never. I blow it today doesn't mean that I can blow it just because I want to blow it. But if we do, we know that he loves us. And all we have to do is come and say, hey, I'll do better tomorrow. I believe in my heart that he's looking down at us and says, I know you will. Because I'm going to help you. Bow your heads, please. Father, we just thank you. Thank you for what the day represents. Thank you for your word. And uh, it's really hard for me, Lord, when I'm looking in, in, in searching the scriptures. There's a few things that's hard. Is to find a good example of a good dad outside of you. Or to find a, a good example of a married couple outside of anybody uh, other than you. I thank you for... Uh, given us this book of promises of hopes with people who were real people people who who were just like me and just like the folks here today and you loved them despite their brokenness despite their selfishness despite their foolish living despite the greed in our hearts you still love us thank you 
And Father, I pray for myself, that as well as the congregation, that regardless of how it all looks today, that tomorrow we'll do it better. That tomorrow will be better. And that tomorrow we will uh, maybe come to our senses and truly say yes to the things that you have promised us. I love you, Lord. Thank you for, for uh, I just thank you for my salvation. I thank you for these people. As they go to, out today, Lord, I pray that you'd be with them, that you encourage them, that you, you empower them to be all that you want them to be. And never going to pray for, for my, my little church here, Lord, without asking that you would get each soul here this morning an unquenchable thirst to be in your word and on their knees and with other people who think the way they do. We pray all these things in the only name that saves, the only name that matters in your kingdom, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's close with him.